If you have a Bible this morning and you want to read with us, we're going to take a reading from the book of Luke, chapter 2. Book of Luke, chapter 2. And as you're turning there, I want to read just a brief message that was sent to us as a church um, by Brother Steve. Thank you for me to read uh, this morning. It says, Dear Old Union Church family, Mary Lois and I want to thank you for the beautiful Christian or Christmas flowers. The road we have traveled the past few months has been difficult. Your loving support has been an encouragement. Thank you for allowing God to use you as ministering angels to us. The provision of months and months of incredible food, dozens and dozens of enjoyable visits, and countless numbers of cards and phone calls has been overwhelming. I feel very small. The action of Old Union Church family reminds me of the scriptures in Matthew 25, verses 34, 34 through 40. Thank you all for allowing God to use you to love Mary Lois and I. Wish everyone, wishing everyone a blessed and Merry Christmas, Steve and Mary Lois. So he sent that to me today and wanted to share that with you all this morning. Again, we're going to take a reading this morning from the book of Luke, and uh, we have a very simple thought today, and um, Brother Joe is really blessed because he's going to get to hear me preach twice today. Uh, he listened to the old-fashioned gospel hour this morning and told me that since he had heard me once that I need to keep it short this morning. Uh, so I'll try to do that, Brother Joe. I'll at least keep my reading short. It'll be the book of Luke, chapter 2, just verse 11. Uh, it says this, says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And that will conclude our reading this morning. And taken from that short text, our thought this morning is, A Savior was born. A Savior was born. Last week, we tried to... um, talk about, at the time of Jesus' birth, how much darkness was in the world. And if you weren't here last week, I'll just give a very brief synopsis of what we tried to talk about a little bit. Um, But Jesus was born into a very, very dark time. And we see throughout the scriptures, even just in the time of Jesus' birth, all the description of what was going on, that Uh, We know the Roman Empire was in charge of the area that Jesus was born into in Judea. And once that man, Herod, the governing authority there, heard about the possibility of a challenge to his throne, um, he was indiscriminate. He had this um, homicidal edict, I guess you would call it, go out that any child that could possibly be within the age range of the king, that he would be put to death. And so a great cry, even a prophecy from the Old Testament, I think in the book of Jeremiah, reveals that there would be a great cry heard there in Judea because of what was done by Herod. Can you imagine that today? Can you imagine having a governor or a president or a mayor of our community make an edict that all children to and under should be put to death so that he can maintain power, that there would be no threat to his power. But that was just the tip of an iceberg of what it was like back then. Um, I suppose, um, we don't use the word a lot, but hedonism ruled the culture of the day. Essentially, eat, drink, And be merry, for tomorrow we die. And so, injustice was the norm. People seeking gain, even if it's at the loss of their fellow man or their fellow neighbor. That was just the way that it was. We look even in God's own people at the time, the the Jews, and we see a religious establishment that Jesus spent a good part of his ministry rebuking because they were so corrupted. They clearly looked out for their own. They were clearly interested in keeping power for themselves as evidenced most clearly by their willingness to kill the very Messiah that they say that they were serving. 
Jesus came into the world and he did nothing but good. Jesus did nothing but good. Now when we say that, we think of perhaps often people that we know and towards us, they do nothing but good. But we can take that farther with Jesus. Not just what people were able to witness of him, but Jesus always, to everyone, including God, did nothing in this world but good. And yet by wicked hands, as Peter says in the book of Acts, they took him and they slew him, doing everything that they could to facilitate his death, that their power might not be threatened, that they could retain control and through ignorance of the people, that they could control their lives and wield their power ultimately for their own benefit, that they strove to make the outside of the cup clean when the inside of the cup was full of poison and they wanted to keep it that way. And so the religious hierarchy that the Jews served under was corrupted and darkness was there. And so throughout the Old Testament, we find as they would come to the temple that there, even when they would bring a pure lamb, they would often, the priests that were there serving would manipulate it so that they could take the best of the meat or they could take the best of the offerings for themselves. We read that. Darkness prevailed in the word of God in one sense. Not that the word was darkened, but its understanding was darkened. That people corrupted the way it was to be read. And so what people did then is very much, and as we're describing it this morning, is the very same things that people do now. It's just evolved into a different shape to fit the culture of our day. People took the word of God and interpreted, and at its core of the interpretation was a way to accommodate our flesh and the desires of the outward man. And so as they talked about a coming Messiah, when they talked about a Savior being born, this Savior had little to do with the inward man, little to do with the spiritual realm, little to do with eternity. And it had everything to do with what American Christianity has similarly corrupted the Christian religion in making everything temporary and outward. Things were about the Roman Empire and the yoke of bondage that the Jews felt under and the the obligations that they had for taxes and the obligations they had to obey those that were in authority in Rome. And so when they would talk about a deliverer, when they would talk about someone coming as a savior, they were looking for a savior to come to relinquish them from Roman bondage. They wanted to be at ease in life. And so perhaps in their minds, as we know in the book of Deuteronomy, it said that one would come like Moses, but not in the fashion that they wanted a man to come like Moses. They wanted a man not with the inward traits that God honored about Moses, but they wanted a man who would come and perform the outward miracles for their carnal benefits. And so they would take all of these Old Testament prophecies and all of these types and shadows and bend those to fit their natural needs. And so they wanted their yoke of Roman bondage to be overthrown by a deliverer, Moses. They wanted to retake the land that God had promised to their forefather Abraham. So certainly there would be a man like Joshua that would come. And he would help them to set off a conquest. And they would just go through that whole peninsula and go through that whole area and just sweep it clean of Gentiles so that they may establish a natural kingdom. And there they could place upon that natural throne A king like mighty David who, as it was sung about him after he had enrolled into the army, that it said, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And so they wanted a king that would go and just obliterate tribes and obliterate nations that they might have an earthly kingdom and an earthly king that they might boast above others about their king. A natural throne. You see... Their idea of what God wanted to do 
was so dark. And it seems almost, well, it is cyclical. The way that man perverts what God's intended word is meant to say. It is cyclical by generations that we we, we come to the knowledge of the truth and the truth like it was in the first century is broadcast more clearly that there's a king and that there was a savior that came, but he's unlike what the natural expectations were. And yet as one generation rises up and they honor God and they, they, they discern the meaning of his word accurately, so they pass away and another one rises up and perverts the entire meaning and again makes the salvation of mankind a salvation that is natural, trying to free us from political tyranny, trying to free us from poverty, trying to flee us from pain and suffering and sickness in this life. But listen, if the Savior that you worship is one that is concerned with the natural flesh, you're looking at or looking for the wrong Savior. This world has been once and for all corrupted. And because of that, as long as time goes on, there is going to be evil politicians. There are going to be people that are searching to wield power for their own interests. There are going to be corporations that will take advantage of people and, 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 and nations and everything that they can. That will always be the case. Sickness, always going to be here. You are going to die. You're going to die. Your body, if God tarries his coming, your body is going to Get cancer. You're going to get in an accident. There's going to be something that transpires. And if God tarries his coming, you will experience a natural death. And so very often you see today that people's, people have changed who Jesus was, just like the Jews did back then. Because what there's something in our fallen hearts that... We want what we want now and here. And our culture has so distorted who Jesus is. And it's not that he doesn't bring healing. And it's not that he doesn't have the capacity to topple empires. And it's not like he hasn't, over the last 2,000 years, intervened within our lives and in mankind's existence to help carnal things or to remedy certain struggles that people have. But listen to me, his end goal was not to do those things, but to provoke a greater spiritual understanding and satisfy a greater spiritual need through those things. You see, as they were, I love where this verse that we read you is coming into play. There's these heavenly messengers that are sent. And they're telling these ordinary people, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. This morning, the greatest news ever heralded in the history of the world is that a Savior was born. He didn't come to save us from an American empire. He didn't come to save us from the sickness that you might experience now or in the future. But the eye of our Savior was on the most important part of mankind's being. And that was your soul. Christ came to save souls. You know, you can have, you can, you can be saved from poverty and sickness and political tyranny and still be in desperate need of a Savior. And it seems that's what the world, Christian world especially, has forgotten today is in every attempt to escape the discomforts of this life, we have forgotten that the spirit of man can be free. 
can be saved by God's grace because of a Savior who was born into the world. And Jesus' life is indicative of the type of Savior that He would be. Born to you this day in the city of David. The city of David. The pomp and circumstance surrounding Jesus' death was not extravagant. It was humble. It was humble. Christmas today, I think, has been infected by a lack of humility. By pomp and circumstance. By pageantry and presence. By all of these things. And I think what it's often done is we've used this as an excuse to satisfy the very thing that people want. To indulge. But listen... Why would we settle for celebrating lesser things when we can celebrate the greatest thing? A Savior was born to us. If you need evidence that you needed a Savior, just be mindful for a moment of the sin that dwells within. Just see the corruption of your own heart. The same corruption that led that nation and that time and those people to those things is still around today. Because corruption, the origin of corruption is not found in politicians or bureaucracies. It's not found in armies. It's, not found, it's found in the human heart. That the root of all sin emanates from the, the human heart. And every person that is born into the world is hopelessly of their own strength infected with sin. And the remedy for that sin, God himself has made provisions for by sending his only begotten son into the world to save us from sin. Praise God that God in his love loved us enough to send His son and the manner in which he sent his son was in such a way to compel men to know and to see their need of a savior. Jesus came into the world and it's been documented and you've heard it. You know the story. Jesus came not with pomp and circumstance, but in the most profound display of humility the world has ever known. God was born. And is laid in an animal trough. God was born. A savior. Notice, notice the angels. They're not even beneficiaries to the salvation that Christ brought. You realize that? There was a great falling away even in the angelic world. Back a long time ago. And God did not make a means for salvation for the angels. And yet these angelic beings sent by God to be messengers. And notice who they're coming to. They're coming to lowly, humble shepherds. Men of no report. Men of no renown. They're coming just outside of of Bethlehem and they're announcing. It's as though that God was so eager to share the message that he could not wait until Jesus was born. Of course he did thousands of years ago through the prophets. But in addition, he sent these angelic beings to come and share with these men. A savior has been born to you. And it is almost as though these angels, not beneficiaries to the salvation that is offered to us, are just rejoicing because they know that there is going to be a race of people that stand a chance to be reunited. That yes, just like those demonic forces, just like Satan and all the demons, we fell into sin and yet God made salvation available for us. They had never seen redemption accomplished for any other creature, but they're eager to see our redemption accomplished, whether they could be beneficiaries of the blessings that come with it or not. And so they begin to sing, and the announcement comes, and these angels begin to sing. And notice, they're just glorifying God for a Savior that didn't even die for them, but would die for us. 
praising his name. Could any greater paradox exist than God and a baby being one? I mean, think about it. The limitless, infinite God is right there. He's just a baby. And he's crying. God is crying in a manger. And yet he's God. Like all power is in him. By him, all the creation is sustained at the word of his power. And yet, he's a baby. His mother has to change his diaper. And yet, it's God. Humble. To add to insult to the injury, he, his family had to flee. Because they're after him, and so they go to Egypt, and they live a while there, and they, go, they travel back when God reveals to Joseph that it's time to come back to Nazareth. And finally, he grows up and said once, said it a hundred times, I guess, that one of the amazing things about the life of Jesus is that he didn't talk until he was 30 publicly. Like he's living in darkness, and the light of all life dwells in him. And all the corruption that he sees in mankind and all the darkness and all the sin and all the death and all the pain and all the lost souls that are wandering out and manipulating and doing all the things that lost sinners, hopeless lost sinners do. And Jesus, God on earth, is silent until it's appointed by the time of his father to begin to speak. And then when he's going to speak, I mean, I don't want to say this. Like, if you're amidst a group of people and the things that they were talking about are not just like slightly wrong, but are abhorrent, the arguments that they're making or the things that they're suggesting, is it not hard, don't you often perhaps even prematurely, interject your opinion. It's like you can't stand it. You can't stand even to hear contradictions and injustice and all the things that often people are relegated to hear whenever they're in the midst of people who are just full of foolishness and error and sin. And yet Jesus is just quiet. What an example for us, isn't it? To wait until the Spirit compels us to speak the message that He would have us to speak. And then when He does, the message that He has to speak only brings life. That's the intent of it, is to bring to life, bring life to all people. A Savior was born for all people. That's a, all within itself, that's a, a profound thought that nobody can sin to the extent that salvation is not available to them. God desires to save all people. And the wickedness of people both in the scriptures, are, 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 the wickedness of people in the scriptures is not outdone by the wickedness of people today. As people roam around indulging in all forms of licentiousness and sin, and you think to yourself, that person is beyond hope. Praise God that God came not only for all types of people, not only people of all ages, not only people of all time frames, but God came to save people of all degrees of sin. In the sense that they perform those sins, that they exercise those things, the corrupt heart is the same, but certainly some people fall deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. And God came just as much to save them as he did the most righteous person on earth. God came to save sinners, and he came to tell the world that. He wasn't pretentious. He wasn't 
arrogant. He came humble from birth, humble into adulthood, respecting the culture of the time that man's not able to have much public input and be well respected until he's about the age of 30 years old. He waits. Respecting that at 12, he's slightly rebuked by his parents and he goes home and he obeys his mother and father. And then he begins to speak. And at the heart of the message is, I want to save you. I have come to save you. People weren't interested in that type of salvation, just like they aren't today very often. Today, people want the flash, the glamour, the glitz, the, all the things. And I'm afraid sometimes we've turned Jesus into that, you know, walking around with a halo. I don't think Jesus walked around with a halo. He walked around with quite the opposite. An ordinary man, subject to the same weaknesses we were, being aware of the same things, like struggling with the same things that people wanted saving from. He didn't have a place to lay his head. Right? So he was impoverished. Jesus was poor. Right? Jesus was poor. And so he wasn't looking to be saved or save others from poverty. Jesus experienced all the heartaches and hardships that you and I do. But all the while through his ministry, you can see through his words that his eyes are fully focused on man's heart. He wants to bring light to the darkness of the soul of man. And so everyone that he speaks to, everyone that he's ministering to, his aim is to shine the light of the gospel into the heart of man. And that's what he constantly does. And some people are receptive to that. And as they're listening to it, they're trying to reconcile. Yeah, but all of my expectations of a savior look like this. And yet this man is speaking in a completely unanticipated way. I never expected to suddenly come upon a man looking like this from the place that he's at, acting like this. And yet there's something about him that is so compelling It is though that a messenger from heaven has been sent and is speaking to my heart. He went around and there were people and he tried to reconcile the ministry of Jesus with the ministry of their own expectations. And Jesus would finally tell people, listen, you can't have both. And many of them would walk away. He would speak messages and they'd walk away sorrowful. They'd be disappointed Because what Jesus was trying to do is strip away all the dependence upon sight and the desire for carnal things and to show them spiritual truth and be a savior of their inward man. And yet, they didn't want that. They didn't want that. This morning, I'm here to proclaim to you today, we serve a God who came to save soul sometimes something in the Bible for them to have hearts that would receive the message of Christ Christ allowed them to go through years and years and years and years of natural suffering and then Jesus came and he used the healing of their body only in so much that their hearts would be open to the healing that his words could bring. These angels, some of these people in the scriptures rejoiced that a savior was born. Some people wanted to blend the identity of Jesus and who he showed himself to be with the expectations they had and blend them together. And when Jesus prevented them from doing that, he said... You have nothing with me. Jesus, in and of himself, who he was, we don't need to add or take away anything from him. He's perfect. 
just the way that he is. Other people were wholly dissatisfied with who Jesus was. Wholly dissatisfied with the fact that he did not come to set up an earthly kingdom and make things on earth just a little bit more bearable. And so they rejected him. This morning, I want to advocate to you today, there is rejoicing. When I love the song that Brother Danny sung. I believe it was the last one that we sung. Hark the herald angels sing. I mentioned this last week. They're heralding what Christ saved us from. There is coming a day, and I'll close. There is coming a day where all the salvation we think we need from this natural realm will be forever unneeded. Like one day there's not going to be poverty and sickness. One day there's not going to be sadness or sin. And when you stand before the throne of God, and when I stand before the throne of God, I'm going to want to have a Savior. You know, it, I want to pause and say this. It's amazing today how the human heart still longs to have a natural Savior. I think sometimes we mistake in a role model for a Savior. As in, you see somebody... And there's certain qualities, there's certain things that they do that you think are, are good and helpful and you want to emulate. But then there becomes this really dangerous place where we begin to almost semi-deify those people. Where those people become, in our minds, worth lifting up far beyond what they should. Where we begin to think that they have some ability to conquer sin or weakness that they don't suffer from the same things that we do and we lift those people up and so society at large can do that with political figures that there's going to we're all, all this kind of problems going on in America so let's look for someone both on the right and both on the left of the political spectrum let's look for somebody who will come and just sort all of this out to uh, to prolong our lives of prosperity And so people look for this Savior, and there are some people who have a Savior complex where they believe that they're the ones, a mother towards her children, a father towards his children, perhaps a business owner towards their business, a political figure, some celebrity, some people think that they're some Savior and that they're going to come and solve all of the world's problems. And so very often people begin to follow those people only to eventually learn They're very, very far from a Savior. And all the while they were saving you from these natural things, you know what they were likely doing? They were toxic to the part of you that really needed saving. Jesus, the angel, told him in verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The Lord has many names, We call him Lord, we call him God, Father. We call Jesus a variety of names. But what a great thing that we can call Jesus our Savior. I didn't help him save me. He just rescued me. I like like using that word rescue sometimes because, you know, we... We've become so immune to saving because we say it so often. Jesus saved me. And in that, he rescued me. I was hopelessly lost. And nothing of my own strength could have done anything to move me one inch closer to eternal salvation. And Jesus Christ, the baby born in a manger, rescued me. Today, I worship him. I worship Jesus Christ. Gladly.
worship him and praise him and thank him and herald his name and desire for my life to be all what these men, who these wise men months and months and perhaps later years, oh, when they came to him and they offered their gifts and they bowed down to him and they acknowledged him as who he was. And in the eyes of the world, perhaps, he was just a baby lying in a manger, not worthy of all the gifts, not worthy of all the treatment that they were giving him. And yet, like them, should not our lives be laid down at his feet, offered to him, not because of what he will do for us, but just who he is. That he is worthy. These angels worshipped him because of who he is. And may we do the same this morning. Worship him. May in your Christmas celebrations, you worship him. Say it out loud to those around you. In your gatherings. Not just little Cute sayings like he's the reason for the season. But I mean, adore and worship and exalt him for who that he is. Because he is worthy to be heralded to the whole world as a savior from sin, a savior from death. And I'm thankful this morning that he is my savior. He's rescued me. He was born into this world to rescue all men. And I'm thankful that's who he is. Somebody have something on their heart this morning.